I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you guys. I had a heck of a time getting dressed in that by myself. See, that's what happens when you give your servants the day off. Hi everyone, I'm Daisy Victoria and welcome to another Getting Dressed video. Today we will be exploring 16th century Venice, Italy. One of the many things Italy is known for during the Italian Renaissance is the wealth of fashion. And what's really cool about Venice is that it basically was its own a little fashion pocket. While Venetian clothing does have many similarities to other Italian clothing, it's actually quite unique to Venice. The dress I will be putting on today is a very fancy dress for those of high stature, a court dress if you will. As this is a style of court dress, it is meant for one to look very fashionable and not meant to be worked in. So you'll see this is a dress that's meant for a special occasion and not meant for things like doing chores, which is really cool because it's one of those really fun, beautiful dresses. The dress I'm about to show you was based on and inspired by Venetian Renaissance portraits from the mid to late 16th century. It's not based on any specific portrait, but rather on my own design, which was inspired by these portraits. The first layer worn is a chemise or shift, or in Italian, a camicia. This garment is made of white linen and it sits closest to the skin, thus protecting the clothing from your skin oils. If you want to make one of these, I actually have a PDF patterning and sewing tutorial for this style of camicia, and I will link it in the description below. What's really interesting about 16th century Venice is that it's one of few places this early on where we actually see ladies wearing drawers. I'm actually going to put on my 19th century drawers here because I was far too lazy to make a new pair since no one sees them anyway, except for right now when I show them in a video. Next is a pair of bodies. A pair of bodies, I know that sounds a little strange. It's actually a garment constructed somewhat like a corset or more closely actually like stays. This is an evolution away from using the dress for support and toward using a separate garment to shape the body underneath the bodice. The pair of bodies is basically a pair of dress bodies. This garment, which later became known as stays as it evolved in future periods, allows the torso to be contained inside a rigid shape, which here provides a conical silhouette popular in the period. It's actually a very comfortable way to shape the body. This pair of bodies has tabs at the bottom, which I find help with comfort over the hips. I bone this garment with flat steel boning. I do have another with a more period reed boning. That one is also completely hand sewn, and as it is presently in storage, this garment here will be just fine. There's no rule for where the pair of bodies laces up. I'm lacing mine in front because that's easiest for me to put on by myself. As a side note, my pair of bodies has a very wide lacing gap and that is on purpose. The reason for that is because I only wanted to make one. So I ended up making one that had a huge lacing gap on purpose. So that way, even if I change size by several inches, it's not a big deal. Now this is a little small for me, even at my smallest, and that's totally fine. What I did not want was for it to be too big and then I would have to make another one. A petticoat helps to provide volume for the skirts worn on top. Since cartridge pleating or gauging appears in portraits from this area and it helps a lot with volume, I have cartridge pleated this petticoat. This one is made of poly taffeta. In period, taffeta fabrics would have been silk. I tend to use a lot of cheaper alternative fabrics on layers where it doesn't matter as much or no one sees it. So that way I can reserve the more costly fabrics for the things that are gonna show the most. If you would like to make a petticoat like this, I actually have a tutorial on my channel, which I will link in the description. That tutorial teaches you how to make this skirt. This garment here is a partlet. It is made of white linen. We do see partlets in period made of fancier fabrics too, anywhere from this style to very sheer and delicate. The partlet is really cool because it decorates the neckline without requiring an entire extra garment. So you can have basic chemises or camisias and many different styles of decorative partlets. My partlet here has a ruffle at the neck. This is the main dress. It's made of a very beautiful dupioni silk. 
I'm going to note here that the color of this dress is not based on any particular images, so it's a bit of a fantasy. I found a dubioni silk made of both red and blue fibers, so the red goes in one direction, the blue in another. So when you look at the fabric, it appears to be a sort of purple that shimmers with more red or more blue depending on the angle. And when I found that fabric, I just had to have it, and it had to be a beautiful Renaissance gown. Also, dupioni silk was not considered in period to be as nice nice as a smooth silk like a taffeta because it has all those slubs still in there. I actually like the slubs because I think they add a little bit of texture. A placket goes behind the front lacing gap in the dress. It's also possible to wear an entire dress underneath and for that to be the fabric showing through here. The placket is lined and boned at the edges so that it stays rigid across the front opening of the dress. Venetian gowns from this period are known for having a very large front gap, so the placket here is quite wide. Plackets can be pinned in, placed with hooks and eyes, or even just sit behind the lacing. With a pair of bodies underneath and a dress on top, especially if you're not doing a lot of activity, it's not likely to move around that much. The dress is laced up using ladder lacing, so it kind of looks like a ladder when you're done. My bodice is accented with hand-sewn beads and pearls, which is a personalized accent I chose to add. The skirt is cartridge pleated onto the bodice, which, like the petticoat, allows a lot of volume to be pleated into a very small waistband. The bodice of this gown is pointed at both the center front and the center back, something that we see in Venetian images specifically. While a bottom contrast fabric is not super common in the images, it does appear in some, and I wouldn't have had enough of that silk fabric without adding it. The sleeves tie onto the dress, so the dress can be worn both with and without them, which is really nice. The sleeve cuffs are accented with white Venetian lace. Hair is often worn in some sort of braided configuration. I started mine with Dutch braids in my hair, as seen in most of my getting ready videos from this time period, and I will be doing a method of hair taping. For these hairstyles, we tend to see the hair located more toward the back of the head, and to do this hair taping, I'm using a plastic yarn needle and threading some ribbon through it. Then I am essentially sewing the hair onto my head by catching my hair that's attached to my head, as well as sewing around the loose part of the braids. I like to start at the back of my neck and then sew all the way around my hair so I can then tie off the ribbon at the back and I can either cut it off or tuck in the ends or tie them into something pretty. If your hair is shorter or if you just want some more volume, you can add false hair to enhance the style. it's time to accessorize. Jewelry is essential for a fashionable Venetian lady. Beaded belts are very common, as are pearl necklaces, earrings, and rings. I do have a PDF tutorial for drafting and sewing a Renaissance kirtle. Please note that if you'd like to use that for this type of dress, you will need to shape the bottom of the bodice so that you have the points, and you'll need to do cartridge pleating for the skirt. I love this dress so much because it is both beautiful and comfortable. The fit is excellent, it's supportive, and I feel amazing when I wear it. I have a thing for historical fantasy, and I think this dress really hits that mark. It is clearly historical, yet also it has that magical fairy tale feel I hold so dear. I feel like this is something you would see in a fantastical historical movie or TV show. One of those fancy ones though, not the ones where they put everyone in drab colors. I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you guys, I had a heck of a time getting dressed in that by myself. See, that's what happens when you give your servants the day off. 
In all honesty though, I haven't worn that dress in a long time and usually when I've worn it in the past, either I go to an event with someone and I ask them for help, just like judging everything and making sure it's perfect before I leave and or <laughs> When I get to said event, I find a friend and we kind of help each other, you know, make sure everything's smooth, everything's tucked in properly. So if you go to events and you have a friend, you know what, that's what friends are for. I actually make my court gowns a little bit easier to put on by myself these days, whereas it seems like I made that one before I'd quite figured out how to do that. Please subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything I post here. You can find me on the social medias as Daisy Victoria. My website is daisyvictoria.com. And I want to thank my patrons over on Patreon so much for helping to make the continued creation of this content possible. I'm excited to share my next projects coming up. I have a couple of historical fantasy and more period historical things in the works, and I hope you will come back to enjoy them with me. For now, I hope you have a magical day, and I'll see you again really soon. Bye-bye.